just not good with the ladies, like you said. Right? All right. Try this on her. Hi, I'm Paul. You have beautiful eyes. Uh, hi, I'm Paul, and you have beautiful eyes. I'd love to take you out sometime. I'd love to take you out sometime. So how much? So how much? With a great taste, it won't fill you up and never let you down. Make it a Bud Light. Okay, guys, here's a question for you. <clears throat> Boxers. Why did they bother with gloves? Why not have these athletes go at it without gloves? What's the big deal? What's the worst that can happen if they're going at it without gloves? Any ideas? Serious injuries. <laughs> okay, so what kind of injuries are we looking at? Like potentially broken bones. At 100%, yeah. I mean, broken bones. The amount of force required to break somebody's cheekbone or face is probably the same amount of the energy required to break somebody's hand, right? All right. I mean, if you hit someone so hard to cause an injury or broken bone in the face, it's probably the amount of force required to break your hand. Okay, so, I mean, these are well-trained athletes, and you can just have them go at it. And if you have them go at it, number one, it's probably not going to be as interesting, and also it's not going to last as long. All right. If you're looking at the boxing videos, I'm surprised I don't have any from 60, 70 years ago when they, they didn't have gloves or they had something. I don't remember exactly what they had. The style was boxing completely different All right, because people didn't want to injure their hands. So they used to hold their hands like this and that because they were not able to go wild, gyrating motions and uppercuts and that sort of stuff because they knew that if, they're, if you're going to try to break somebody's face, more than likely you're going to end up breaking your hand. So um, wearing a glove, what's the advantage of that? I mean, does it reduce... The impulse, you think? No, the like, impulse. Yeah. The impulse would still be the same, but it would increase the time, so it would decrease the force. All right, give yourself twenty points with that one because this is more of a trick question, guys. The impulse is going to be the same. I got to tell you, with or without gloves, the impulse is going to be the same. Someone hitting you in the face with gloves or without gloves, it's going to be the same. I right, got news for you. For example, um, I love Tyson. All right, I'm a big fan. I used to spend a lot of money pay per view back he was the king in the late 1980s when i was a college student that was a complete waste all right because that guy you literally you pay 20 bucks just to uh watch him box and then it, you just drink beer and then now you have to go to the bathroom by the time you would come back it would be done with it, it would be that fast um i'm gonna say he no longer boxes obviously and then it almost i i can create the impression that you can pick a fight with him that guy can take my face from zero to 100 miles per hour with or without a glove, end result is going to be the same, guys. All right, so velocity on my face is going to go from zero to 100 regardless. That's your impulse. That's your impulse. If he's wearing gloves, though, I got a story to tell. If he's not wearing gloves, who knows what's going to happen. All right, either way, my face is going to be moving at 100 miles per hour. So the question is, what do the gloves do? It's not going to change the impulse. It's the same impulse. The impulse is changing momentum, right? So my face is literally is going to go from zero to 100 miles per hour. Except the only thing it does literally is increase the impact now, reduces the force. In turn, the damage is going to be lessened. Either way, in my face, is going to go at 100 miles per hour. He's going to knock the shit out of me, basically, regardless of it. But one of them is more than likely survivable. And without the gloves, who knows? All right, so this week's factor is the explanation of electron acceleration. <clears throat> so the acceleration is how fast the velocity changes in time, how fast you speed up, how fast you slow down, how fast you change direction, right? All right, so acceleration is what kills, what breaks your bones, what maims you. Okay, you're not going to be able to change your initial velocity or your final velocity. All right, I mean, this guy is going to take my face from zero to 100 miles per hour regardless. That's what's going to happen. This guy is that strong. I can influence the impact time. If I influence the impact time by making it larger, I may be able to survive the incident, which means that I can reduce the acceleration. Because we, we know what survival is not. You know you can survive between 70 to 12 Gs, up to a few minutes. You can survive between 20 to 25, up to a few seconds. And you also know that you can survive up to 140 Gs for a fraction of a second under extreme constraints. All right, so those are what's considered survivable. So the question is, how do you go from acceleration to something a little bit more powerful? All right, so impact, collisions, whatever. You end up in jerking motion, which means that you end up in a variable acceleration. All right, so if the acceleration is variable, what do we use? We use the average acceleration formula for it. The whole idea of making impact survivable is to increase the impact time. All right, so increasing the impact time, that's going to reduce your acceleration. So acceleration, by definition, is how fast the velocity changes in time. Uh, that's how fast the velocity changes in time. So you go from an initial to a final velocity within a certain time period. Right, acceleration is a vector, so it's going to have direction. Right, what causes acceleration is a force. So force acting on this mass is going to cause it to accelerate. Acceleration is how fast the velocity changes in time. All right, so get rid of the duration or the time. 
I apply on both sides by the time of the duration. And you come up with an expression that's going to have a combination on the left hand side of the force and its duration. And so when there's a force acting on a mass for a certain time period, just like this delta T is, what it does, it causes the motion to change. So which means that the velocity changes, all right? So the velocity of this mass changes. The velocity of this mass, combination of mass and velocity is known as momentum, all right? So the combination of force and its duration is known as impulse. So what happens during impulse? There's a force acting on this object, it changes the momentum of that object. So that's your impulse. Impulse is a combination of force and its duration. What happens during impulse is the velocity is going to change, which means that the momentum is going to change. So momentum is the same as motion. All right, so let's do a lecture review. So what's impulse? It's going to be a combination of force and its duration. So what happens in impulse is the momentum changes. So impulse changes the momentum. It's momentum, it's the mass moving at a given velocity. All right, so velocity is the speed and its direction, right? All right, so if you're speeding up, that means that your velocity is changing. If you're slowing down, it means that your velocity is changing. If you're changing direction, that changes velocity, it also changes momentum. All right, so why do we use the average average force in impulse calculations? Guys, at the end of impulse means collisions, which means that there's impact, which means that there's variable acceleration, which means that there's jerk in motion. If there's jerk in motion, what do we do? We use the average acceleration formula. Right, so acceleration is caused by a force. So what is your variable acceleration is your variable force. So which means that you have to use the average force. All right, so what happens is momentum during impulse, what happens is momentum changes, which means that velocity is changing. Velocity changes during impulse. So what happens to the force is the duration of impulse is short. If the duration of impulse is short, the force gets larger. So if you reduce, all right, so impulse is changing momentum, obviously. So for a given impulse, if you reduce the impact time, it's gonna increase the impact force. <clears throat> if you increase the impact time, that's gonna reduce the impact force. Okay, so boxers wearing gloves, not gonna change the impulse. In my example, my face is still gonna go from zero to 100 miles per hour, punched by Tyson, obviously. <clears throat> so that's your impulse, it's not gonna change. If he's wearing gloves, it's only gonna increase the impact time, so that's just gonna reduce the acceleration. So it's gonna reduce the impact force. It's gonna make it more survivable. All right, so what's the uniform momentum? Mass is gonna be expressed in terms of kilograms. Speed is gonna be expressed in terms of meters per second. So impulse is gonna be kilograms, meters per second. Impulse is, you got the force, it's gonna be in terms of Newton's, Time is going to be in terms of seconds, so it's going to be Newton seconds. All right, so impulse and momentum will have the same units <clears throat> because impulse will change momentum. So, which means that the both of them could be expressed using the same identical units. Doesn't matter which one you use. We'll have the same same units. That's weird. I missed something. Okay, move forward. <laughs> Troy's plan is to enter a grizzly's den and extract a blood sample from a sleeping bear. And the grizzly proof suit is the only way he can do it. You can't get close to a grizzly, it'll kill you. If you haven't got a protective means like I do, you're dead. <laughs> Troy recognized the need to get close to the grizzly early in his research. My first year of college, I watched a preview of Robocop. I said I could build one of these, and this is my research vehicle. Reaching this stage of development was a long, difficult, and painful journey. He named the first suit, created in 1985, the Ursus Mark I, after the grizzly zoological classification, Ursus Arctis Horribilis. The first suit was simple hockey, baseball, lacrosse. I had 12 different sporting equipment. That's the only amount of money I had, and that was the best plastics they had. Well, that was thrown away in an hour. I mean, a simple uh, half swing with a baseball, that'd break your arm. Three years and four suits later, Troy creates the Ursus Mark V, constructed of more durable equipment like ski boots and motorcycle gear. Troy's tests grow more intense to replicate a grizzly's phenomenal strength. The trials border on the lethal. Troy's research assistants use wooden bats to test the strength of the suit's outer shell. Swings to the face test the durability of the headgear. Troy is shaken, but not injured. He decides to increase the force. Troy still isn't satisfied, so the punishment continues. A 150-pound sandbag, swung from a height of 25 feet, strikes Troy directly in the face. The blow levels him, but does no harm. Troy believes this suit is ready to face a full-grown bear. A three-ton truck moving at 25 miles per hour. If you can handle the truck at 50 kilometers an hour, I have no problem with anything a grizzly bear can do. 
To be sure, Troy increases the speed to 30 miles per hour. After this test, Troy concludes that the suit needs improvements. I think Troy needs some improvements as well. Troy. So what's the whole purpose of the suit? Increase the impact time, right? Some more survival. Place to the face has the durability of the headgear. Troy believes this is more intense. Temporary Kung Fu practitioner. As with your mind twister. The existence of Chi has never been under question. When properly focused, this is the energy that enables them to transcend the physical limitations of flesh and blood and perform feats that appear to Chi. I've seen people make a single brick before. Challenge the I've never seen what he's about to do before though. The impossible. <clears throat> The first one is broken. So is the second one. So is the third one. So is the fourth one. Wow. Impressive. All right. So, of course, they could just set it up in such a way that it breaks one of them and the other three are broken, but we didn't notice it before. Let me just set it up for you in the final fashion. All right. Let's compare this guy to another guy who's just as strong. And another martial artist who happens to be just as strong, except the other guy is only going to be able to break one brick at a time. Uh, so this guy end up, clearly end up breaking four bricks with a single strike. And the other guy is going to be just as strong, except he can only break one brick at a time. All right. So the fact that this guy is able to break four bricks with a single strike, does that make him more powerful? All right. Let me ask you, who do you think is more powerful? All right, given the fact that he's able to break, break four bricks with a single strike, does that make him stronger or more powerful than a guy who's able to break only one single br brick at a time? What do you guys think? All right, this is a bit of a mind twister. Does that make him stronger or does that make him more powerful? Bum, bum, bum. All right, guys, what do you have? Okay, hold on. There are comments. I'm not able to see the comments. Okay, so for those of you guys who are saying more powerful, what do you mean? Okay, so those of you guys who said more powerful, okay, so they could be equally strong, right? In terms of, let's assume that we got two guys, both of them are martial artists. They have, they're equally strong, which means that they could lift maximally the same amount of weight. So let's just pretend that they're going to be able to lift the same amount of weight. So, which means that they're equally strong. All right. So the question is, the guy who's breaking four bricks with a single strike, how is it that he's actually more powerful? All right, that's what you have on that. Is it something like they're able to decrease the impact time and that's more force goes through. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, so let's think of it. If you reduce the impact time, okay, so power is how fast the work is done, right? All right, so how fast the work is done, how fast the energy is transferred, how fast the energy is converted, either way. All right, so the shorter the impact time is, larger the power is going to be, right? All right, so shorter the impact time is, the larger the power is going to be. That's what it means. Okay, right, let's skip to the same thing. Um, how about the impulse? Do you think both, in both cases, they deliver the same impulse? The guy who's breaking a single brick versus a guy who's breaking four bricks at a time, are they delivering the same impulse? Okay, so they have the same strength. They're not equally powerful. The guy who's breaking four bricks is actually more powerful than the other guy, despite the fact that they're equally strong. How about the impulse? All right, do they generate the same amount of impulse? What do you guys think? Okay, these are like these are interesting mind twisters. Hold on, I'm just noticing that I probably slightly better if I had my iPad. In. All right, so the guy who's breaking four bricks at a time is moving his hand much faster than, than a guy breaking one brick at a time. Okay, so what do you suppose the reason for this? Okay, guys, here's the reason. All right, you guys, are next one.
First the novice. The computer displays the results. First, the novice. Novice versus expert. Then... What's the difference? Impact time is much shorter in the case of the expert, right? Why? Because his hand is moving much faster. Question is, why is that his hand is moving faster than a novice? Guys, you're a novice. I'm a novice. Most of us are novices. I've never broken a brick before by hitting it. All right. And, but I can move my hand just as fast as an expert does. There's no question about it. Okay. You can come up with the same technique. You watch the guy a couple of times, a couple of tries. You can, you can execute it just as well. Except that guy is going to be able to break the bricks maybe 100% of the time. And if I'm lucky, I'm probably going to break one after I try 20, 30 times. All right. What's the difference? Difference is confidence. Difference is confidence. The expert, this guy had done it a thousand times. So he's gonna he's gonna move his hand regardless, and he knows he's not gonna break his hand. All right, he's got that understanding. He had done it a million times. If I'm a novice, I'm I'm afraid that I'm gonna hurt myself. So I may make it look like I'm doing a good job, but in the last second, you will just and young me. So that's the difference. All right. Thanks. The more powerful guy is more powerful in the sense that he was able to transfer the energy faster. Both of them are equally strong. All right, both of them are equally strong. The guy who's more powerful is able to transfer the energy more okay so the next question is let's do a comparison who's going to be able to generate a larger impulse the guy who's breaking the break or the guy who's not breaking the break what do you guys think i think it's going to be the same all right so who's generating a larger impulse now you have to go back and think about the meaning of impulse so what's impulse in this case impulse is change of momentum right change of momentum so change the momentum of the hand what happens to change the momentum of the hand? Let's pretend that you're going to hit the brick at 50 miles per hour. So your hand is going to go from 50 miles per hour to zero if it doesn't break, right? And if it breaks, okay, your hand is going to slow down, but the change of momentum is going to be smaller, right? Okay. In reality, breaking a brick is going to generate a smaller impulse, believe it or not. It's going to generate a smaller impulse. The impulse is going to be smaller if you can break it. The impact time is going to be shorter, which means that the force that you're generating is going to be larger during impulse. Okay, despite the fact that both guys are equally strong, the guy who's actually breaking the brick is generating a larger amount of force and the other guy who's not breaking it is not hitting it with, his ma with the maximum amount of force that he could. That's the difference. He's generating a much larger impulse, but his impact time is much larger. As a result, the force is not large enough to break the surface. All right, so in essence, the guy who's breaking the brick, despite the fact they're equally strong, that guy's hitting it with his maximum strength. The other guy's not hitting it. Not as fast, that also means that the amount of force that he's generating is not large enough. Okay, that's an interesting way of looking at it. All right, uh, let's try to come up with the best answer. Okay, let's just put your answer in the chat. Put your answer in the chat. All right, we got six, seven, eight, nine, ten responses. Okay, so um, it's the action and reaction force, right? <laughs> so, which means that the forces will be identical. So you guys got that beautiful. All right, you guys didn't get fooled. All right, so that was good. Action and reaction force. Conservation of momentum is the concept that we we're focusing on this week. All right, so it's a head-on collision between A and B. It's exactly the same as hitting a brick or a person getting hit by a train. A head-on collision between a car and an SUV. Action and reaction forces will be the same. All right, so mm, conservation of momentum from a math perspective. In the absence of an external force acting on an isolated system, only forces are internal forces or action and reaction forces. Action and reaction forces will become the internal forces of a system. Internal forces will not cause the system to accelerate. That's what it means. So, which means that the total momentum before impact and the total momentum after the impact will be equal to each other. So, that's the model that we're pursuing. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is just want to make sure that you have a good understanding of what's going on. So, let's express things conceptually. So, the question is what happens to the object's momentum if the net external force? If there's a net external force acting on it. Okay, so let me just emphasize the term on the object's momentum. We're not talking about a system, you're talking about a single object. Okay, so what happens to this motion if there's a net external force acting on it? Guys, if there's a net external force, 
acting on the mass, which means that there's going to be impulse. It's going to change the momentum of that object. All right. In fact, if you isolate the force in this equation, you end up getting force causing change in momentum within this duration. Momentum is obviously the mass one at a given velocity. So what's happening because of the force, the velocity is changing. Change in velocity in time is going to be acceleration. So the net external force causes the object to accelerate, which means that the net external force causes the velocity of the object to change. And what that means is the net external force is going to cause the momentum of that object to change. Okay. So far, we've been expressing the force in terms of acceleration. All right. And from time to time, we're going to start to express it in terms of change in momentum. All right. It's a much more powerful expression than mass accelerating mass. So much more powerful than, in fact, equation e equals mc squared came out, out of expressing force in terms of changing momentum. So that's a, just a very powerful mathematical method. All right, so if there's an external force acting on a mass, what's gonna happen, it's gonna accelerate, which means its velocity is gonna change, which means that its momentum is changing. If velocity is changing, its momentum is changing. The next question is, what happens to the momentum of an object in the absence of a net external force? So what happens to the momentum in the absence of a net external force? Guys, if there's no force acting on it, what happens? There's no change in momentum, all right? Let's, there's no acceleration. If something is moving to begin with, it's going to keep on moving. And then straight at a constant speed, so velocity is not going to change. If something at rest, it's going to remain at rest. So, which means that now you fall back to Newton's first law. So that's known as inertia. So nothing is going to happen. It's just going to remain constant. Isolated system is a system that only concerns itself with colliding objects. Two masses colliding, that's your isolated system. Uh, Head-on collision between a car and an SUV, that's your isolated system. Car and an SUV. Person getting hit by a train, that's your isolated system. All right, so isolated system, a system that only concerns itself with the colliding objects or interacting objects. So what's the net external force between two colliding objects in an isolated system? Between two colliding objects in an isolated system, you only have action and reaction forces. Okay, so action forces are gonna act on a small mass, the reaction forces are gonna act on big mass. But notice that action and reaction forces of an isolated system will become internal forces. They're gonna be equal to each other in opposite direction. So this force summation is just gonna add up to zero. So the net force of an isolated system is going to be zero. Right, so it becomes an internal force. So the net force becomes an internal force, and it's zero. So which means that the isolated system system itself is not going to accelerate. So the next question is, what happens to the total momentum between two colliding objects in an isolated system? It, it's not going to be a change of momentum. Total momentum is not going to change. Total momentum before and after will be equal to each other. That's what it means. Change of momentum of one object is going to equal to the change of momentum of the other object. That's the meaning of it. All right, so the momentum for each mass is going to change the same amount. So what's the meaning of conservation momentum? Conservation momentum simply means the momentum is going to remain constant. Initial and final momentum will be the same. So the next question is, what conserves momentum? Absence of an external force on an isolated system. <clears throat> <clears throat> what conserves momentum is an absence of an external force on an isolated system. So the net force acting on an isolated system is going to be zero. All right, so let's go back. What is, uh, it's supposed to be a lecture here. Lastly, what's elastic collision? What's an elastic collision? Elastic collision, every collision is gonna conserve momentum. If it's an elastic collision, kinetic energy is also conserved. An elastic collision, the kinetic energy is not conserved. So the elastic collisions will conserve kinetic energy and elastic collisions will not conserve kinetic energy. All right, so that's the difference. All right, so every single collision is gonna conserve momentum. All right, so you got approach, you got collision, and what happens right after collision, depending upon the type of collision, if it's elastic, kinetic energy is conserved. If it's inelastic, kinetic energy is not conserved. So that's the difference. All right, so speaking of collision. He had to run over to our force to weaken. He's going to keep trying to be in contact with two colliding bodies. When a quarterback is chased by lineman, he's at a. All right, uh, those of you guys who don't know, this guy quit playing like 20 years ago. Uh, one of the best quarterbacks ever. He's like 5'7, five, 5'8. Five, he was quick, uh, quick as hell. It's impossible to catch. Now I noticed that he's going to get <laughs> just boom. Okay, so what kind of collision is this? Elastic or inelastic? And why? All right, so what's the difference between elastic and inelastic? If it's elastic, kinetic energy is conserved. If it's inelastic, kinetic energy is not conserved. So what do you think? This is elastic or inelastic? Inelastic. Okay, give yourself five points. Why is it inelastic? Well, kinetic energy is not conserved, which means that the kinetic energy must have been converted to something else, right? So the question is what? Well, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Variations in player size, speed, and direction have different effects on the two colliding bodies. When a quarterback is chased by a lineman, he's at a tremendous distance. You guys hear the sound? Where's the impact? So it gets converted into sound. What else? Then it gets converted into advantage. This, and then there's tons of deformation. There. The lineman. 
all real life collisions will be inelastic. Okay, guys, real life, there's no conservation of kinetic energy in real life. There's always the sound is going to be generated. If there's impact, there's going to be sound. There's going to heat. Heat is going to be generated. There's going to be some sort of deformation. Only in idealized cases, you end up getting in, you end up getting elastic collisions in idealized cases. All right. If there's any sort of force transference, um, for the most part, kinetic energy is not, not for the most part, nearly 99.999% of the time, you end up getting an elastic collision. So which means that kinetic energy is going to be lost. More massive and moving with greater momentum. Faster than a quarterback getting ready to... I'm just trying to think of a case where the kinetic energy is conserved, okay, in particle physics, in small objects or whatever, obviously that happens. With solid objects, big objects like this, it's just, there's always going to be some sort of deformation. Bro. Mechanics, the mechanics that we were dealing with, I cannot imagine a case where you end up being an elastic collision. As a larger player transfers, when you're dealing with molecules and atoms and whatnot, if they are neutral, look at this momentum to the quarterback, the quarterback finds himself moving in the direction of the line's momentum. Yes, but not in these cases. So, Professor, where does well, there is more controversy surrounding the MTV show that is called Jackass. A Kentucky teen recently broke bones. Potentially avoid being hurt. The boy stood in front of his friend's car. He would have to jump several feet straight up into the air to avoid being hurt. It was impossible. Okay, guys, if the car is going at 30 miles per hour, the guy's going to be moving at 60. The car, he would have to jump several feet straight up into the air to avoid being hurt. It was the car is going at 40, that guy's going to move at 50 miles per hour, give and take. The car is moving at 50, the person getting hit is going to move roughly about 100 miles per hour, roughly. Okay. So, action force acting on him is going to be about 40,000 pounds. Reaction force is going to be acting on the car, so it's going to be about 40,000 pounds. So, same force acting on the car. If the car is more massive, the acceleration of the car is going to be smaller. The car is going to go from 30 miles per hour to about 29 to 28 miles per hour. What was the car hitting here? Where am I getting those numbers from? In his friend's car, attempt to stop several feet up in the air. You have to jump several feet. All right, so this is how deja vu, guys. We had this discussion before. Straight up into the the train is going at 60, the person getting hit is going to end up flying off at 120 miles per hour, almost. Almost double the speed, almost double the speed. Here, to avoid being hurt, it was impossible. Acceleration of the train is not going to change that much. The train is going to have a very small acceleration because it's very massive. The person is going to have a huge acceleration because the person is not as massive. Where am I getting these numbers from? I said, I'm getting those numbers from the conservation of energy and momentum principle. Oh, that, that's what we will discuss. All right, if you take a look at this, notice that at the moment of impact, if my hand is moving at five miles per hour, this thing is going to move at double the speed. In fact, it moves out of the way so fast that I can move my hand right after the impact without touching it again in reality. All right. So why is it? It's not the question is not why. The question is where am I getting those numbers from? Okay, so that's what I want to discuss. The 16. All right, so this is the problem in this case. So we got a car. I, I it's kind of a problem number eight. So the amount of force. Action force is acting on the person. The reaction force is going to act on the vehicle, right? So determine the final speed of the person. If the car is moving at 3 miles per hour, the final speed of the person is going to be roughly about 60, close to 60, not exactly. Uh, final speed of the car, the car is going to go from 30 miles per hour to maybe about 29 to 28. So what's the change in momentum of the person? What's the change in momentum of the car? I got news for you. Action and reaction force is being the same. The change in momentum of the car and the person will have to be the same because as a result, net momentum of the system. Total momentum of the system is going to remain constant, whatever that means. Okay, so we had discussion about A and B before. Let's check to see how the numbers work out. So the person is going to get hit by a car. A car is going at 30 miles per hour. All right, so the bigger mass, the smaller mass. The car is moving at 30. The person is not moving. And after impact, what's going to happen is the car is going to move almost at the same speed, slow down a little bit. And the person's speed is going to be nearly twice the speed of the vehicle. All right, so that's what we expect to see. And let's check to see if that's what we will get to see. All right, so... Mass of the car, the person's mass, the person is 150 pounds to give and take. The car is moving at 30 miles per hour. A mass of the car, this is about 5,000 pounds. All right, so what's the speed of the car after impact and what's the speed of the person after impact? Okay, so we had a little bit of, we got two predictions. The car is going to move nearly the same speed, maybe about 28 to 29 miles per hour. And the person is going to move nearly double the speed of the car. All right, so that's what we expect if the collision is elastic. All right, so we do the conversions. Mm. All right, boom, boom, boom. All right, so here's the first formula. This is going to give us the speed of the car. Here's the initial speed of the car. This is the final speed of the car. All right, and we got the numbers, so put the numbers in. And we end up getting about 13 meters per second. This is going to be about 27 to 28 miles per hour. I think it's about 28 miles per hour. So car speed goes down by about two miles per hour. So that's in real life, it would be about 26 to 27, so we end up doing 28. That's not bad. Okay, now let's take a look at the speed of the person. We choose the speed of the person. 
All right, so here's the mass of the vehicle, the total mass, and here's the initial speed of the vehicle. So when you plug the numbers in, the thing about 26 meters per second. So this is gonna be very nearly double the speed of the vehicle. It's gonna be almost 60 miles per hour, but not quite. It's 58 miles per hour, okay. Almost double the speed of the car. All right, so it's gonna be 58 miles per hour. It's an elastic collision. If, it's, if it is an elastic collision, this is what you end up getting. So it's almost agrees with what I just said, okay. All right, so now we make the assumption that this was an elastic collision. Real life is an elastic collision. So what's gonna happen is bones bones will break this and that. So it's not gonna be 58 miles per hour. It's probably gonna be close to 55 miles per hour. The vehicle speed is not gonna be 28. It's probably gonna be 26 to 27 miles per hour. Okay, so now you can make some adjustments. All right, so we figured out the speed. So how much the momentum change, how much momentum changes for the person and how much does the momentum change for the car? Guys, it's a, okay. Conceptually, and change of momentum for a system is gonna be zero. All right, so net momentum before and after impact is gonna be the same. So the change of momentum of the car is gonna be the same as the change of momentum of the person. That's what it means. All right, so which means that the motion is gonna get transferred to the person. All right, so the motion loss, the momentum loss by the vehicle is gonna become the momentum of the person. So momentum gets transferred, that's what it means. So the change of momentum of the person is related to how much the velocity of the person changes within that duration. All right, so initial speed of the person was zero, so we know what the final speed of the person is, so you plug the numbers in. So this is the amount of momentum that the person, change of momentum that the person undergoes. And when you do it numerically, if you're looking at the change of momentum of the car, and when you plug the numbers in, we're gonna end up getting the same change of momentum for that. All right, so the momentum that the person gains is going to be the momentum that the car loses in this case. And then the total change of momentum of the system is going to be zero as a result. All right, so the next thing is, uh, I'm interested in part C. Okay, so what is the magnitude of the impact force? The impact lasts only a hundredth of a second. All right, so we want to express the force in terms of pounds. What's the magnitude of the impact force, if that's the case? All right, so what do we know? The impulse theorem. The impulse is going to change momentum. All right, so we know the duration of the impact. The impact is gonna last for a hundredth of a second. That's what we end up getting. All right, so we are interested in the, the magnitude of the impact force on the person in this case. You end up getting a number like that. Change of momentum of the car is gonna be the same in the opposite direction. So that's gonna give you the reaction force. Notice that action and reaction force are the same, just as expected. And they're about 40,000 pounds. All right, that's it. Okay, that's how I was generating those numbers. The earlier portion of this course. So that's how it's done. Okay, so the other thing I want you to know that this was a lot of math for you guys, for those, those of you guys taking college physics and you guys are taking college physics. Okay, math is not that important, but I want you guys to be able to interpret the meaning of what we just saw. Okay, so that's what I want to focus on right now. Next, Detective Walt Edward. Which means that I want you to be able to interpret the formulas, those two formulas that we came up with. the secret behind this game, where you have to get the ball to stay in the tub. There's one game that I see very frequently, almost at every carnival, it's that bushel basket game. And that just annoys me because I'll stand back and watch, and I'll watch people walk up and get cheated. Because you can't win the game the way it's set up. I'm not going to be able to win this game the way it is set up. The player stands back. Why? Such a dis Because this game is unwinnable. Distance. Okay, I kind of hate well, what I just said. Obviously, it's kind of funny at first glance. But seriously, you guys, when I ask you these kind of questions, some of you guys answer it just like that. It's kind of weird. But when I say, and the angle why is it that you cannot win this game and some of you guys say because it's unwinnable that's not what the question is guys that's not the answer to that question the question is why is it that you cannot win this game that's what the question is you can't just answer it because it's unwinnable all right what makes it unwinnable is what the question is the basket you cannot win so the question is why not and the ball won't stay in there and so the reason why it's unwinnable is related to you want to give them the impression that there is a champ something that these guys understand really well and obviously most of you guys lack that understanding to win. And it's a good chance. And <laughs> they cover his face. <laughs> in reality, there's no chance. To... There's no chance. You cannot win that game. The only reason, or game, only reason why it, they're going to make it look like you've got a little bit of a chance is because they believe a ball in there. Sometimes the carney will reel you in with a free throw, but you can bet that's usually rigged too. It is rigged, so the question is how. <laughs> and as soon as you have to throw that, that's... he's going to remove the ball. It's a classic scam right there. What he does is he puts the ball in ahead of time and tells her and he made it from that angle he made it look like it's going to stack oh you throw one in it for practice and what happens is her ball goes in hits the one the reason why it went in because he ended up hitting the side so the motion got transferred in that drive that he put in there and the 
from the angle that you're throwing. The will stay in, but when out comes their money, out comes that other ball, I guarantee it. And now here's another game of chance. Fat chance, more like it. Yeah. All right, so. Because the team was to knock down both book bottles or one. All right, kind of, we have to knock both of them down. Roll the ball. It doesn't matter how fast you throw. Can't be done because what the guy. Okay. It does is he'll actually nudge one of the cook files slightly in front of the other, maybe. Okay, and then how does that work? An eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch. So what happens is when you roll the ball into it like that, the ball hits one of the bottles there, or you can clearly see one. Okay, and then you can pay more money and then try to go faster and faster. In front of the other, there it went. The energy from the ball was absorbed in the first bottle, leaving nothing for the second bottle. Uh, that's cute. All these little scams add up to big money. So why is it that it doesn't matter how fast you throw the ball, you're not going to be able to knock down both of them? Okay, so how come you can never win these games? Get the ball to stay in the tub. First one, you're not, you will never be able to get the ball to stay in the tub or the bucket in the case. That chance is more like it. And you will never be able to knock down both uh, Coke bottles at the same time. The object of the team. All right, so how do I know that? How do they know that? Right, so let's focus on that for the conceptual portion of the test next week. Okay, there are three cases that we will deal with. Mm -hmm. Three collisions, three different collisions. Number one, the incoming mass is going to be much bigger than object hitting head. All right, it's like train hitting a person. All right, so the train hitting a person. The person is about what is this? 170, 150 pounds or something. Train is 10, 20, 30 million pounds. All right, that's the case that you're looking at. Okay, if the train is coming at you at 60 miles per hour, what do you expect? The speed of the train is going to be about almost. It's going to remain at 60. It could be 59.999 miles per hour. The person's speed is going to be double the speed of the train, so it's going to be about 120 miles per hour. Okay, so that's what you would expect to see. Right, so the train is going to be much more faster than the person is. Okay, now trick of interpreting this is the person's mass is very small compared to the train, so it's negligible. We say it's ignorable, it's negligible. So you just say ignore it. Okay, so if you ignore it, the only mass that you have to focus on is the mass of the train. So the mass of the train divided by the mass of the train is just going to cancel out. So the initial speed of the train and the final speed of the train is more or less the same. So the train is coming at 60. After the impact, train is moving almost 60 miles per hour, almost, slightly less than that. Right, so that's the case number one. So what happens to the person? I said the person is going to move double the speed of the train. Once again, the person's mass is significantly small, so the mass itself is insignificant. So I just ignore that because we want an estimate. Notice that the mass of the train is the dominant term, so masses will once again cancel. Notice that the person is going to be moving roughly about double the speed of the train. Okay, so roughly about double the speed of the train. So the train is going at 60. Now the person is moving at 120 miles per hour. So that's the case that we discussed. What if the masses are the same? Like the player balls. What if the masses are the same? Okay, so I'm trying to make a decision. Okay, what if the masses are the same? If masses are the same, mass A is going to be the same as mass B. Okay, guys, if masses are the same, what happens here? Okay, M minus M is going to be zero. All right, so which means that this is, this is, coming, this is the first player ball approaching at a given speed. So what happens to the speed of this billiard ball hitting this mass? It'll come to a stop because masses are the same. So what happens to the second billiard ball? Now let's go on to this one. All right, so you got the masses are the same. So two times this mass plus M is going to be, again, two times the mass. All right, so they will cancel. So you end up getting one there. So which means that the second billiard ball is going to move at the speed of the first one. All right, so the first billiard ball is going to come to a stop. The second one is going to start to move at the speed of the incoming one. Okay, so you know what that means, right? What that means is the baseball and the Coke bottle, they have identical masses. So it doesn't matter how you how fast you roll the um, baseball because they got identical masses. That velocity is going to get transferred to the uh, Coke bottle. And then this one is going to come to a step and the other one is going to keep moving. All right. And then the bushel basket thing goes like this. <clears throat> okay. So here's the small mass. This is the mass of a baseball. Here's the big mass. The big mass is going to be the wall that you're looking at. Okay. So the wall, the, the baseball is going to be the mass of the baseball is insignificant compared to the mass of the ball. Okay, now how do we do the interpretation? This time you can, mass of the baseball is going to be ignorable, so that term is going to drop out. Okay, so if you ignore the mass of the baseball, so what happens? The mass of the ball is going to cancel, it's going to be one. So which means that the, the ball, coming ball, is going to bounce and it's going to go in the opposite direction at the same speed. So the final speed of the ball is identical to the initial speed of the ball, except there's a negative sign, so which means that the ball is going to move in the opposite direction. All right, here, the mass of the ball is insignificant, so you compare it to the wall, so you can assume that to be zero, so that term is going to become zero, so the masses will become zero, so which means that the speed of the wall is going to be zero. So wall is not going to move, that's what it means. So what happens, the wall doesn't move, 
it all bounces back. It bounces back out of the bushel basket at the same speed. Okay, that's it. So everything has been nicely explained. Okay. Okay.